Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about locking up innocent people. Our guest, Victoria Valenzuela, is assistant publisher and investigative reporter at Sheer Post. We will have a link up at talkworldradio.org. She is a graduate student at University of Southern California, focusing on investigative and social justice journalism. She has worked with the Marshall Project, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, BuzzFeed News, ProPublica, and LA Taco. Maybe we can find out what that is. She is the social media manager for Renewing American Democracy and a fellow with the Law and Justice Journalism Project. Victoria, welcome to Talk World Radio. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing the work you're doing. You wrote an article recently titled Five Victories Against Wrongful Convictions in the First Week of the Year. Doesn't doesn't sound like a huge number, but it sounds like a huge a huge number of, of wrongful convictions, but it sounds like a huge number of successes in in overturning them, or at least four of them uh, overturned. Usually there aren't that many so close together, right? Right. Yeah. And so my article talks about Brandon Pease Jr., who was released um, with the help of the Montana Innocence Project, who's actually still fighting for his exoneration. Um, and then there were two wrongful conviction um, overturned in the United States, um, Renee Lynch and Willie Williams. Um, Willie Williams with the Florida Innocence Project, Renee Lynch in New York. And so they were both exonerated formally um, during the first week of the year. And then there were two in Canada, um, Walter Gillespie and Robert Mailman were exonerated with Innocence Canada. And um, so, yeah, there were five exonerations in the first week of the year, which um, I definitely wanted to bring attention to that and raise urgency over wrongful convictions because if um, our criminal justice system is wrongfully convicting enough people where five people are exonerated in the first week of the year, you know, people should be aware of that. Um, and now all of these people are out of prison, but if you were to total all of the years that they spent locked away for something that they didn't do, it would total to 191 years that they spent away from home. And these are holidays that they've missed out on with loved ones. These are birthdays that they've missed. These are um, even final days with loved ones. Um, some of them lost their parents while they were inside. And, you know, when you're in prison, you're not able to go to the funeral. And this is a grief that they have to deal with in a carceral setting and um, also missing out on births of family members. Um, Renee Lynch was, she's a mother. And so she missed out on seeing her children grow up. She came out to having grandchildren, you know, and she missed those births. And so there's a very big human impact to this too um, of wrongful convictions. And it wasn't caused by anything that they did. This is all from systematic flaws in the legal system. And, um, these flaws continue to exist. You know, the main causes of wrongful conviction are um, faulty forensic testing, uh, mistaken identification, incentivized witnesses, um, coerced confessions, and official misconduct. And a lot of these things, um, this is what you see in a lot of these cases. They're all systematic flaws. And um, every person that I mentioned in this article maintained their innocence. They all you know, to the court, to the jury, said that they were innocent post-conviction. They maintained their innocence, and um, the legal system continued to convict them. And, um, you know, there's been over 3,400 exonerations in the United States since 1989. And so, um, you know, there this is happening quite often. And part of the reason since 1989 is because of the availability of DNA testing before that period of time. There wasn't a lot of DNA testing available. This is like a relatively new science. Um, so people are able to get exonerated um, from this. But, um, you know, sometimes this even goes to death row. There's about 196 um, death row exonerations. And so you can see like there's a big human impact of this. And it's, um, you know, something that our legal system doesn't always correct. It requires someone like the Innocence Project, who's a nonprofit organization of um, attorneys who go and they help um, people who are wrongfully convicted who don't have access to um, 
be able to pay for somebody to um, exonerate them, you know, like they don't really have any options, their appeals aren't working. So the Innocence Project steps in and they help them, you know, so it's not the legal system correcting these flaws. It's the Innocence Project who's doing this. Yeah, it it seems like there was a real growth in these because of DNA testing right. uh, improving and being able to go back in those in that tiny fraction of cases where there was any evidence to test for DNA uh, right. and right. test the old evidence with DNA. But it seems like in these five, I mean, there's one uh, where they tested a hair, but it wasn't even a human hair. It was a cat hair like this was not super advanced science necessary um and the others one was somebody had been had been hypnotized to confess one was a, a witness had been bribed and the other one there was a false witness a false convict uh, convict uh, confession and there was exonerating fingerprint evidence that was hidden by the prosecution so <laughs> these these don't seem like i, I mean are it is are the types of exonerations expanding beyond beyond DNA testing to other types of of exonerations or what what's happening here? Um, well, you know, there is outside of DNA evidence, there is also um, false confessions um, or false um, when a witness makes a false testimony against somebody. And you can see that in the case of um, Walter Gillipsy and Robert Mailman. Um, they were convicted. There was no physical evidence linking them to the crime. It was solely on the um, testimony of two individuals. One of them was given $400. The other one was um, given from a life sentence 13 years. So they were given a smaller sentence. And so um, later... After this conviction happened, um, those two witnesses actually confessed that they were pressured by police to say what they said. Um, so, yes, they recounted their statement. And so that's also like another way that wrongful convictions can get overturned. So it's not always DNA testing. Um, a lot of it can also be um, when a witness um, makes a false testimony and then they decide later to um, to confess that that wasn't really true. Yeah. As far as I understand, unlike a lot of countries, it's legal in the U.S. for police and prosecutors to use testimony from uh, an imprisoned witness who's been offered, you know, a, a reduced sentence or other incentives. Um, so I don't know if that's a crime, uh, but none of these seem like honest mistakes. I, I mean, these all seem like someone intentionally did wrong here, resulting in people spending years and years locked up. It, 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 are there ever any consequences for the people responsible when, uh, I, I mean, I understand a, a government can be compelled to pay some sort of restitution. Here are some dollars for having taken half your life away, but are there ever any consequences for the people who've done it? Um, well, I know that there is the pretty violation that um, I believe if a prosecutor makes some mistake in a case, like if there's some misconduct, then other cases should also be investigated to see if there's also misconduct in those. Um, but as far as um, like punishment, I'm not too sure on that. But I do agree with you. Um, I think having jailhouse informants is really unethical because you have these people who um, are also like facing big sentences in prison and they um, are vulnerable, you know, like they're in a desperate situation where they want to get out. And so you're kind of manipulating them to make these statements to get another conviction. And um, also as far as official misconduct, you don't accidentally hide fingerprint evidence. You know, that's something that, um, where it's kind of like these prosecutors just want to get that conviction. And I've heard people say that before, that they just want to get that conviction. They don't want to admit that they're wrong. And so that's like a big factor of wrongful convictions. And on top of all the harm done to the innocent person locked up, there's also whatever harm you believe there is in letting some guilty person go free, uh, as well as in deceiving uh, the public, including the victims' families and so forth, who are 
in some cases understood to care deeply about uh, the outcome of the case, uh, they're forced decades later to understand that they've been they've been lied to, right? Right. Yeah, and I know there are cases where the Innocence Project is actually in the process of exonerating somebody. They've discovered the assailant, the true assailant, too. Um, but yeah, um, I do think that that's something that's um, a miscarriage of justice when you are not only convicting an innocent person, but you're, um, you know, the families think they have closure. And then it's like, you're also risking another crime happening. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder, we're, we're speaking with Victoria Valenzuela, and uh, one of her recent articles is called Five Victories Against Wrongful Convictions in the First Week of the Year. I wonder how many there could be. I, I mean, it, it, I, I know that a, only a small fraction of prisoners have evidence that can be DNA tested. I imagine false testimony from witnesses tends not to be recanted more often than it is recanted. Um, I mean, there have got to be many thousands of innocent people behind bars that we just don't know, aren't there? Right, yeah, I definitely believe that there is more wrongfully convicted people than the amount of people that have been exonerated. I know that the Innocence Project gets a lot of requests. They're not able to take on everybody. I know that not everybody can afford um, legal help to get exonerated and also takes like many, many years to get exonerated in some cases. So this isn't like a quick fix. Like it can take years of reinvestigating the case about trying to get a trial. Um, there's this case of Marcellus Williams who's incarcerated. Um, I don't remember exactly which state, but he's facing the death penalty. And the Innocence Project actually found evidence that he is innocent and he hasn't been given a trial to be able to get exonerated and show that and so I mean there's these cases where it just it takes forever and then you might not even get a trial you might not be able to um, like maybe the appeals don't go through and so um, yes I believe that there's a lot more wrongfully convicted people than we're aware of and happens in a lot of different ways and to different degrees and there's a lot of harm in some cases there's even posthumous exoneration so sometimes the government will execute somebody and will later find out that they're innocent and so um there's quite a few of those and they're not easy to get and there's still people who are believed to be innocent that haven't even gotten their exoneration both like currently and posthumously so i mean this is a very big problem and it's really systematic well, we will have a link at talkworldradio.org to the Innocence Project in case people want to make a donation, uh, but I think it's going to take uh, systemic changes, banning jailhouse snitches, banning confessions that aren't videotaped, uh, repercussions for perjury uh, and for malpractice. But um, you've reported also, Victoria, about the the harm done by the prison system imposed on immigrants to this country. Um, can you tell a little bit about what you found in that area as well? Right. So in August, I published a story called Double Punishment. And so it basically talks about how the state prison system, I focus on California, but this is happening in a lot other places, not just California. It's also happening like in New York and other um, states too. Um, and so the state government is um, putting an immigration hold on people who they believe to be foreign born. And so sometimes this is true. Sometimes they are immigrants. Sometimes they can also be citizens and people who the government perceives to be an immigrant uh, happens with naturalized citizens too. It's also happened with the US born citizens. Um, so um, sometimes if this immigration hold isn't removed, then the day that this person who's served their sentence, you know, they're supposed to be released to their community, to their families who are expecting them. Instead, they're transferred to immigration detention where they are seen an immigration judge, they're urged to sign deportation paperwork and could be deported. And one woman I spoke to, she actually was deported to Belize. Um, she served, um, I believe it might have been 17 years um, in the California institution for a woman. And she had children here. She had parents 
who she was looking forward to coming home to. She hadn't seen her kids since she since they were little. Um, and instead of being able to be released to them and reunite with them and make up for that lost time, she was sent to Belize. And um, now she doesn't have anybody there. Um, her family's in the United States, in California. And um, now she works and she's just, she wants to come back, but there's, it's not very common. There have been people who after deportation are able to come back. Um, that's just not common at all though. And there was um, citizens who have also been caught up in the system who, even though they're a United States citizen and they have their paperwork, the state prison system just doesn't listen to them when they tell them I'm a citizen, I shouldn't have this immigration hold on me. You know, and so um, they fight for this, but it's just not resolved until um, closer to their sentence ending, if it's resolved at all. And so for that entire, you know, over a decade, just like many, many years, they're concerned that they're going to face um, an immigration hold. I mean, face transferred immigration detention. And um, sometimes, even if they're not a citizen, it's just, you know, it could be dangerous for them to return. I interviewed um, a transgender man who was from El Salvador, and he was fearing that if he was returned to El Salvador, he would face violence. That's what he escaped from, you know? And so the, there's just like so many things wrong with the system. And it happens so often. There's hundreds of people being sent to ICE um, from California. Sure Post requested documents from the CDCR. And it shows that there's hundreds, thousands of people being transferred from state prison to ICE detention centers. And um, there are even deport deportations out of this. And so um, this is just a very big systematic issue. There's a big human toll to this that people should be aware of. Um, people should be more conscious of um, and accepting of these things rather than just kind of discarding them, facing this double punishment that citizens don't have to face, that white people don't have to face. Like it's, yeah, it's a very big issue. But sometimes you say there are people who are citizens who are mistakenly treated as if they're not. Uh, are they never provided a lawyer? It seems like the worst lawyer on earth would be able to prove that a U.S. citizen is a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are cases where people are able to get a lawyer and help overturn this. Um, a man that I interviewed who had been in San Quentin, and he had an immigration hold for nearly his entire sentence. When it started getting closer for him to be released, he started getting concerned about this. He's a naturalized citizen. Um, and so he had from um, a friend inside, he had got in contact with a lawyer from North Carolina and he had been able to have his ice hold removed. Um, but simply by telling your counselor that you're a citizen, simply by trying to talk to the board of parole hearings and telling them you're a citizen, like that didn't work for them. They did have to get legal counsel. And they did this case pro bono, but like I mentioned in about wrongful convictions, like not everybody can afford that defense counsel and it's not easy to find these things sometimes. So um, yeah. And, and you reported there was legislation uh, passed on this issue in California, but vetoed, is that right? Right, yes. So the HOME Act was introduced by Wendy Curio, and this was earlier in the year 2023. Um, and this was passed through House and through Senate. It had no opposition, and um, Governor Newsom vetoed it. And this would have um, prevented ICE and the state prison system from cooperating. It would have prevented CDCR from sending people to ICE after they're supposed to be released. And it only would have applied to a narrow category of people. It would have only applied to people who are benefiting from existing um, sentencing reform. So for example, um, clemency, like clemency and um, like the the domestic violence law, where if you're convicted of um, defending yourself, if you're a domestic violence survivor and you're convicted yeah. for that, um, then it would apply to that, but it wouldn't apply to like many other cases. And so it was a very narrow law. And even with those provisions, it still was vetoed by Governor Newsom. 
I, I'm afraid he wants to be president and the more they want to be president, the worse they think they have to be. Um, the, uh, the, the other thing that happens with this, I imagine, is a lot of family separations, uh, which we hear about when it's uh, happening at the border uh, and it's on TV or people are filmed uh, in cages. But uh, when someone's deported, families are, are torn apart, right? Right, families are torn apart and it's not fair. And I just, I mean, this shouldn't be happening. Is, uh, how did- how did... In a state like California, that is a sanctuary state that claim to be so progressive, but, you know, the governor vetoed a law that would have prevented CDCR from transferring, like, even the most, like, model inmate people to ICE, you know, like, that's not progressive at all, and, um, I mean... But why would he do that? Who wanted him to do that? Or is it because, is it bigger than California? He wants to be president, and he wants to be unassailable from the right wing i mean i can't speculate but i have heard a lot of um advocates who are in this space talk about he might have political ambitions to yeah. be president and that could be a reason why he's vetoing these bills that have no opposition that should be passed that he is campaigning so hard for incarcerated people he's transforming san quentin from a prison to a rehabilitation center and it's officially like as of recently like it's a rehabilitation center but he vetoed this so it's like is he really on the side of the incarcerated people does he really want to make change you know because I mean he vetoed this and there's other acts that he vetoed too that are similar that would help incarcerated people is so I mean yeah yeah maybe not it so so in some ways California is is moving away from tough on crime, mass incarceration. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it seems that San Francisco elected a prosecutor uh, on a smart on crime agenda that was starting to work and they held a recall and replaced him with somebody screaming tough on crime. Um, so I don't know what, what trends you're seeing. Um, well, California definitely is moving away from the tough on crime law. And I think that era is just kind of like we're moving away from that. But I still don't think we're where we need to be, especially for vetoing laws like this. Um, I think that I'm glad to see like San Quentin turn into a rehabilitation center. And I don't know if you've been able to see their reimagining plan for San Quentin, but it's very progressive. Um, it recommends that in visitation rooms, people have cubicles because aside from that, you're just in like a giant cafeteria room where everybody can see each other. You're trying to like connect with your family because that's the only way you can like connect with your family in person. But you're like staring at like 100 other people. Um, there's also um, single cells being proposed. Um, so, I mean, the reimagining has a lot of great recommendations, but are they really going to put this into effect, you know, because they're recommendations? And so, I mean, I think there's a potential to do a lot of things, especially that California is thought of as a leader in this kind of um, policy change. And so, like, other states are thought to, like, you know, kind of look at that but we need to be able to actually do these things, not say that we're going to do them and not just like put up a shiny new sign in front of San Quentin and say that we're progressive. Like we need to actually be doing the change. And, and actually reducing incarceration. Um, uh, Victoria Valenzuela, you've also reported on the death penalty uh, where uh, California is ahead of much of this country. Um, Although the, most of the world is ahead of of part of this country, what what have you what news have you been reporting on regarding the death penalty? Well, yes, the death penalty still is very much around in the United States, even though California has a moratorium on the death penalty. It is still here. Um, 
there's a new governor, they can always reverse it. And so, um, I mean, there's a lot of other countries that have already abolished the death penalty. There's a big movement in the United States to abolish the death penalty. Um, I'm not sure if you've seen, but there is actually somebody scheduled to be executed on Thursday. It would be the first um, nitrogen gas execution in the country. And to me, that's not a step forward. That's a step backwards because we're about to execute this man with that with gas that's never been tested before, with gas that veterinarians don't even use on animals because it's so horrible. And we're going to use that on people. And that's, I mean, that's a huge step backwards. You know, there's a call to end the death penalty, but California has a huge, um, a huge death row population. And um, there's been, like I mentioned before, like 196 death penalty exoneration. So there's also people who are innocent that are getting sentenced to the death penalty. Um, there are people who are innocent that are executed with the posthumous exonerations that I mentioned before. Like, it shouldn't be allowed. And then you think about, like, the human toll. Like, that's devastating for the families who have to survive them. I'm actually working on a story right now about a daughter who survived her father who was executed by the death penalty. And it's just heartbreaking. It's like, these are people who have, like, they have families, they have memories, they have shared intimate moments together and for the government to murder them with legal homicide, like that is insane. It is insane and most of the world is past it and much of the United States is past it. And even in recent years, state after state is getting rid of it. Uh, is there, we, we've just got a couple minutes left. Is there any effort uh, to, to legally ban it beyond just a moratorium? in California? And, and if there is, will it get vetoed? Um, I'm not quite sure on that. But I know that there are organizations that like they create petitions for every single person who's on death or who's facing an execution. So I mean, if people are looking to get involved to stop these things, they can get involved in that way. And um, yeah, I I'm trying to think about what else I can say about this because I have so many thoughts on the death penalty. It's just, well, I it's look, really... go ahead. No, I'm sorry. What were you going to say? I will look forward to reading your, your next article on this topic. Um, but we, we've got just a minute left. Victoria Valenzuela, where can people go to find your work and keep up with what you're writing about going forward? Yeah, check out sheerpost.com and that's where you'll find me um, along with a lot of other great stories that we do. We also focus a lot on criminal justice. So it's not just me. We have a wrongful convictions beat basically dedicated to sustaining a sense of urgency around wrongful convictions and exonerations and just like really holding the criminal justice system to account because these things are really impacting a lot of people and you know, it's systematic flaws that continue to exist. And um, yeah, this it's, it's really concerning. Well, I'm glad you're on the job. And Shear Post, I believe, is named for Robert Shear and is spelled S-C-H-E-E-R post.com. Uh, Victoria Valenzuela, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.